Welcome to the Partnership Economy. This podcast explores the power of partnerships through candid conversations with industry leaders. Join our hosts, Dave Yavano, CEO, and Todd Crawford, co-founder of Impact.com, as they unpack the future of partnerships as a lever for scale and an opportunity to put the consumer first. Today, we'd like to welcome Fred Ayle. He's had a long 30-year career on both the agency and brand side of business, having led marketing for top brands, including McDonald's, Redbox, and Jockey. Fred, welcome to the program. And really just wanted to kick off with a very high-level question for you. You know, just curious to hear how you view what it takes to capture someone's attention today to get them to buy your goods, like compared to, let's say, 30 years ago. I think the biggest change today, Dave, there's some things that are evergreen and some things that are new. The things that are evergreen is you've got to have a really compelling story to get someone to pay attention to and buy your goods and tell it in a really compelling way. So what is it that makes you unique and different? Why should I care? Why should I buy you? That, I think, has been the same story forever. What has changed is there are just so many different ways that you can tell that story than there used to be before. You know, back in the day, it was sort of TV, print, and maybe some direct mail and radio. Now, you know, with the explosion of the digital channels, the different digital platforms and the different devices even, there's just so many more ways you can reach that consumer that I think is what's really changed significantly. And then on top of that, the ability to measure the effectiveness of those channels. So I have this impression of Mad Men, you know, people just at an agency sitting around the chalkboard kind of trying to come up with that next jingle, trying to get everybody to kind of sing along, you know, to the same tune to buy what you're telling them to buy. What was it like back then? And how would you compare that to now? I'd just love to unpack your analysis on how consumers are making buying decisions then compared to now and just how that evolution has really shaped your revenue and customer acquisition strategies with the different companies that you've worked with. Yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest change is just, first of all, the input to the creative process is just so much richer now than it used to be because there's so much more data around consumer behavior and consumer profile than there was then. So in some respects, if you can suss through the good data, the bad data, if you can come to a real insight, there's a lot more data to drive that insight than there was then. You know, then there was probably just the restriction of primary research if you were doing that and then looking at seeing what was buying, but you didn't necessarily know who was buying it. Now, with all the data measurements that you've got at your disposal, you can know a heck of a lot more about, you know, just the different segments, their behavior, their insights. That is an input to that process. And now the other thing, as I mentioned before, there's so many different ways to tell that story. And there's so many different channels in which to tell that story. The roles of those channels are really different than the role of the channel then, which was primarily awareness focused. Now you've with the channels that we've got, you've got not just top of funnel awareness, but you've got all the way through the whole funnel, whether it be mid and bottom funnel conversion that we didn't have line of sight to before. So I think just the idea of input and then measurement to the extent that you can suss out the good measurement from the bad, the good input from the bad, the data rich intelligence poor, that's another evergreen issue, right? It's like, I know what data is the most important. I'm not sure exactly which is. That was somewhat true then. It's even more true now, I would say. Mm-hmm. One of the things that stands out to me that's different, if I were to compare to, let's say, 30 years ago, is the fact that I think brands were doing a lot more like talking directly to the end consumer through advertising and other forms. And it was less about what I think happens a lot more now, which is where the consumer seems to be more in control. They're the ones that are kind of sourcing commercial-based content like about what to buy and other people's experiences, let's say, with the brand. Would you agree with that no, comparison no question. to now versus then? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no question. I mean, I think you're still trying to interrupt a conversation, much like you were in the day, right? In that case, it was, I'm going to interrupt some content to tell you a story. Now you're sort of interrupting not just content in some cases, but you're interrupting a conversation. It's almost like coming into the party and breaking into a conversation pod and saying, oh, let me tell you about my brand, right? Um, From the social side of it. And so Mm -hmm. you better make sure that you're breaking into the right pod and you better make sure that you're bringing something that's of interest to the Mm -hmm. conversation or everyone's going to sort of turn and leave. So I think Mm -hmm. that's the the real challenge today. You know, know, how do brands deal with that? Like, how can they be more part of the conversation as opposed to interrupting 
the conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's got to happen more organically, right? You've got to rely more on, you've got to be as good at having people find you and wanting to find you. This goes back to the storytelling aspect. This goes back to having a point of view to things that are relevant and authentic to your brand as it relates to the cultural conversation. And so that I think is really important that you want people to sort of come to you as much as you want to go to them. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I, I go back to, again, it's understanding that consumer, it's understanding that consumer's need and insight. Mm -hmm. It's understanding Mm -hmm. how you can best fit that need as a brand. To me, the biggest challenge right now for any marketer is how do I have relevant differentiation to my key consumer? And that's really important because I can be different, but if it's not relevant, no one cares. I can be relevant, but if I'm not different, then, you know, what am I bringing to the party? So I think that combination of relevant differentiation is really critical for Mm -hmm. your key customers and driving that as much as possible is going to be critical, whether that's product differentiation, whether that's even go-to-market or messaging differentiation. I think that is the critical challenge for all marketers today. Mm -hmm. I know you've run affiliate and other partnership programs at Redbox years ago, for example. To me, that challenge is for brands to really get other publishers, other affiliates, other influencers, or even other businesses to really get behind your products and services and talk about you, as opposed to you trying to have a direct conversation, interrupting that that party conversation, like you were saying, and get them to recommend them. I remember I was talking with you before you had a really funny analogy, working with influencers. I don't want to steal your thunder, but if you recall, you had a comparison of working with influencers, so-called influencers years and years ago compared to now. You want to share your view on that? Yeah, if I recall the conversation, Dave, it was, you know, what we call influencers today, we used to call paid endorsers, you know, 20, 30 years ago, right? And typically they were celebrities and you paid celebrity endorsers because they were well known, they were famous, they had some sort of a brand about them and an affiliation about them and they had a fan base that you wanted to tap into. And now with the influencer market, we can all be paid endorsers because we are putting out content, individuals are putting out content that draws an audience and you want to try to talk to that audience through that influencer. And so it may not necessarily be someone who's famous the way we talked about famous people back in the day, whether it be Michael Jordan or whoever. And now it's an influence. It could be a TikTok influencer who's got a million followers who's very famous in that environment, but may not be as well known in sort of the popular culture or the more mass culture. And there's a lot of them out there. So mm-hmm. the question then becomes, how do you find the right influencer? I think in our Redbox days, we were talking to some influencers who were talking about movies and reviewing movies. But we came to find in some of them, one of those cases that the influencer was a really good looking guy. And many of his followers were following him because he was a great looking guy as opposed to reviewing movies. So then the big mm-hmm. question becomes, is that really the following that you want to be tapping into because they didn't mm-hmm. care about the movie so much as they cared about his looks. So you've really got to watch the audience, not just the audience, but why is the audience following this person? And is it for the content or is it for other reasons? And if it's for other reasons, then that may not be your right audience. And if it's for the content, then that may be your audience. So trying to find out, A, is this influencer drawing the right audience for the right reasons? B, is the makeup of that audience, you know, how much of it is real versus mm-hmm. how much mm-hmm. of it is, you know, bots or other sort of. And so that's sort of the data cloud that's out in the influencer world, actually into the digital world that we as marketers are facing. You know, how many of these are real people? How many of them are people that we want to be talking to versus bots mm-hmm. or other people? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what you just outlined was typically where a brand is pursuing an influencer and trying to select them proactively. There's the other side of working with influencers or other creators, and that's where the creator is pursuing the brand. This is the right. The, you know, they're just there's just something happening here, which I think is just fascinating and awesome. Where you've got a whole new ecosystem of content creators that are just passionate about certain brands and products and some of it um, just adds to their social currency to be the first to talk about something. And so from that angle, you know, they're, they're typically going to a brand, maybe they'll grab their commercial links, their affiliate links, and they'll add that to their video description or to the content that they're creating otherwise. But I just love that part of it. Any thoughts on like what has been driving this evolution of commercial based content that's being published kind of in mass across platforms like YouTube and Instagram, TikTok now, and then in other forms. What do you think is driving that? Well, I mean, I think what's driving that, you know, in terms of just the rise of influencers in general is now we all have a platform, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of us as individuals through social media have a platform to use as we see fit Mm -hmm. and to engage other people like us. And so 
you can do that in mass with no barriers to entry. And so some people's plan, so that, that opens up, you know, what could any of our individual platforms could be, right? I'm a big sports fan. So I could say, you know what, I'm a co-owner of the NFL franchise, the Green Bay Packers. I'm passionate about the Packers. And so I'm going to use my social media platform to talk about all things Green Bay, potentially, right? Mm-hmm. And now suddenly, depending upon what I'm saying, I'm drawing a following, you know, that agrees with the point of view that I may have. Mm-hmm. And suddenly the Green Bay Packers may have interest in me, you know, talking to that audience. Mm-hmm. Um, vice versa, because I'm passionate about the Packers, I may want to go to them and say, look, I'd be like to be one of the first people to be talking about this. Mm-hmm. And as a brand, you sit there and go, that's great. But tell me why you are, mm-hmm. you know, sort of expert in doing that and or tell me about your following. So mm-hmm. it's a mm-hmm. little bit of a chicken and egg kind of a thing, right? Some, mm-hmm. some people are like, I'm going to be bleeding edge and I'm going to find brands that are bleeding edge. I'll be the first to talk about them. And that's the currency that I bring to that environment. Mm-hmm. And people are going to seek me out as sort of a first reviewer, first sort of choice editor, if you will, mm-hmm. of certain mm-hmm. brands or certain verticals. And that's their mm-hmm. currency of the realm. And those brands are going to seek them. And conversely, brands will seek people who have suddenly got a huge following that they want to be part of that conversation. So that's where I think the discussion between brand and influencer is really an interesting one to your point, because... Mm-hmm. Both could be seeking the other for different reasons. And it is to be part of that conversation that hopefully is a nice interruption as opposed to a sort of hand-handed interruption or forced interruption to that conversation. And you can see with some influencers, right? I mean, they start to talk about brands and it's really organic and it's very authentic because Mm -hmm. they've been using the brand for a long time. It's part and parcel of what they are delivering in terms of content and their interests. And that seems very natural in some cases. And in other cases, you can see the the very sort of Mm -hmm. forced I'm now going to stop talking about what I usually talk about and start mm-hmm. talking about this brand and it comes out of nowhere. And that mm-hmm. feels just as much like a paid advertisement as it does mm-hmm. anything else. So the more organic you can make the storytelling to that person, mm-hmm. the better and more effective it's going to be. Well, my theory on that is I agree with you. I think that you know these content creators are focused on authenticity and, and what they really think, even if it includes... You know, some negative points about a product, right? That's what's real, right? Everyone knows when there is a, a filter on an Instagram photo and they don't engage with that as much as a real raw photo. Maybe that's why Snapchat is as popular as it is with uh, some younger folks. But I believe that they are authentic because, and this is the part I love about how things are evolving, is their focus is on the end consumer, like their audience, their relationship with their audience. They put that as top priority. They don't want to lose a subscriber. They don't want negative comments, you know, uh, on the content that they're creating. And so I love this about how things are evolving is that they, they're putting the, the consumer front and center, right? It's no longer an ad that is telling you what to buy and then you, you find out that you were fooled. It's not a great product. The level of quality and the experience for the consumer is just improving like significantly. And I think along with that, there's just a lot of choice out there. Mm-hmm. And I think you had some thoughts as to why that is. Why is there so much buying happening? Why is there so many options of what to buy if you were to compare 30 years ago to now, let's say. Well, just think of digital as a channel for engagement, right? As well as a channel for distribution. So now I can get anything delivered to my door through the digital channel and elsewhere within 24 hours and sometimes that same afternoon. Mm -hmm. So the long tail is now realized. Before you were so limited in terms of distribution and points of distribution, Mm -hmm. as well as inventory, that you just didn't have that much choice. Now, you know, I can source anything from anywhere in a matter of days or less. And I'm not limited to retailers in this country. I can buy from overseas if I wanted to. And so that barrier of distribution and that barrier of inventory is now gone. Present supply chain, you know, accepted. And so as a result of that, the choice is somewhat overwhelming, which to some extent breeds the need for influencers in a lot of cases because they become my choice editors. If I don't want to go through and decide which of these 10 potential products to buy from, I want to go to my choice editor who says, you know, here are the top two. Good. That makes it easier. Or I'm going to go look at reviews and see how many positive reviews are there and what's the what's within those versus the negative reviews. Sort of like back in the day, before I'd go to a movie, I would look to you know, a certain movie reviewer and say, you know what, that reviewer has the same taste that I do. So by and large, whenever this person recommends a movie, I know that probably eight times out of 10, it's going to be one that I like too. So I'm going to listen to that person first before I waste my $10 and my two hours to go mm-hmm. see a movie. Mm-hmm. Now expand that at scale across almost every product cat- or service category in the world. Mm-hmm. And you've got something very, a very similar dynamic going on where you've got somebody who's 
providing a point of view or choice editorship in certain, in, in all categories. And you've got an audience that doesn't want to do the research necessarily and say, you know what, I want to truncate this decision process. I'm going to see what they have to say before I finally make a decision either because I'm not in the category that much or because I don't want to spend the time. So you've got the people that do want to spend the time and those that don't, and they come together and say, let me tell you why you should buy this product and why. So you're back to sort of the paid endorser model or the word of mouth advertising back in the day is now at scale because you've got channels and platforms that enable that. So, I mean, the other aspect of choice that I think is critical, Dave, is you think about, you know, the advertising channels back as early as the even early to mid 90s you were really limited to just the broadcast channels, right? There was the um, sort of commercial and the cable sort of video channels. And then there was not even satellite radio. And then there was the local national. And so as a result of that, there was a scarcity of advertising occasions that you could actually go to. And because they were bid up by all the major advertisers, they became very expensive. Well, now with the rise of digital, there's those barriers have basically ended. And now anybody can access different channels to reach a different audience. Mm -hmm. And so now suddenly with the fracturing of the messaging, there's actually almost, I won't say an infinite, but there's so many more channels by which you can put your message out there. Mm -hmm. But now the barriers to entry have fallen so much yeah. so that you can see direct to consumer and even startup brands doing streaming television and connected mm -hmm. TV video, as well as even online, the, the other online videos mm -hmm. to drive top of mind awareness in a way that they probably couldn't have if they were in business 20, 25 years ago. That's so true. Like anybody can sell anything now and they can get their content and the awareness for themselves published on any platform. There's so many platforms to publish like who you are and anybody can talk about you. You know, there's 2 million stores on Shopify now, which is amazing. So there right. is a lot of choice. I think consumers do need guidance. This is where they're finding, you know, the sources of information is from these content creators, these publishers are, you know, kind of sharing what they think and giving their recommendations. This is what we really believe is driving this partnership economy brands trying to align themselves with these creators of content, these other businesses that are in this position to refer business. But you mentioned something about advertising back then. And we were talking a little bit about advertising now. It almost seems like we're getting back to you know, the way it was with you. You talked about the broadcast channels is what I'm anchoring on. When you look yeah. at the trends in big tech right now with the loss of IDFA from Apple, the loss of you know Google's signaling that they're going to do away with the cookie and retargeting, the net result is you've got more demand going into fewer sources of supply. You know, basically, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and the other top social platforms. So you figure there's maybe 10 places to put your ads now where you can effectively target, track, and measure, but you've got to rely on their targeting, tracking, and measurement almost completely because of a loss of being able to do that on your own. What are your thoughts on it? Have you seen that trend firsthand? You know, this a loss of the ability to target, track, measure, yeah, reliance yes. on some of these top new broadcast sort of stations, if you well, will? Well, yes. And what I would say, Dave, to that is all these are auction and bidded platforms, right? Mm -hmm, and so now mm -hmm. to your point with fewer and fewer of them, there's more and more of us bidding it up. So now your mid-bottom funnel channels are becoming really expensive. You can't scale a business just on those alone. So we are sort of going back to the future in terms of top of funnel, broader brand awareness building platforms, which are typically video, forms of video, are now becoming most effective in scaling awareness of a business quickly. Mm -hmm. um, whether it be streaming or connected or traditional, if you will, broadcasts you know, over air is now sort of we've gone back to the future that that's the best way to reach a mass audience more effectively because there are so many more channels and ways to do that. So it becomes a little bit more cost effective and because the mid bottom funnel channels are becoming more expensive to mm -hmm. scale awareness because of the more people sort of bidding up to get what you want, you know, mm -hmm. the audience you need. The other thing to your point too is because you don't have the data there that you had to anymore, you've got to start to build your own sort of primary database mm -hmm. and build your own audience yourself in order to, to get that. And you're going to have to incentivize people to tell them more and more about yourself. You have to incentivize them to opt into your loyalty programs. And then once you've got them into your loyalty programs, your ecosystem or opt into your email for mailings, email, that type of thing, you're going to need to incentivize them somehow to tell you more and more about yourself besides just the buying behavior in order for you to understand that in that profile. Mm -hmm. So the value equation has sort of changed a little bit again. It's sort of back to, you know, tell me where you live. I'll give you something in return. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I'll give you something in return, you know, in order for you to build your own sort of opted in primary data. Then the interesting thing that happens to me is, and I've worked with a couple of companies recently who see them in most companies are seeing them as 
we're using product or service to build a primary database that then we can monetize, mm-hmm. sell that mm-hmm. behavior and that data to somebody else. So they mm-hmm. are using their businesses to build a database and then using that database as another source of revenue to sell to somebody else or to mm-hmm. affiliates or partners so they can understand, A, mm-hmm. the buying behaviors or profiles of those people or mm-hmm. to use them as another audience to market to. You're seeing the retailers doing this, right, with their own sort of marketplace exchange in the ability to advertise because they've got an audience that they want to mm-hmm. leverage and monetize. They've got buying behavior within that audience that they want to leverage and monetize to either their marketing partners or to other marketers who may not even be in their ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting with this um, privacy movement and the loss of effectively being able to target someone, even including some of the streaming and connected addressable TV capabilities. It does seem like there's some risk and the potential to really target, to be fully realized. And I think that really kind of begs that you said something that I thought was really interesting that a lot of people might be surprised by. I think you said something about broadcast TV being one of the best ways to build a brand. You need awareness essentially to be effective at scale. But what what I think is likely to happen, I think you're a fan for this as well, is I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that marketing mix. Because my feeling is having that TV impression, if you will, maybe your other media works harder, right? You're going to get more creators excited about your brand or uh, lend some credibility to yourself. That's just my initial reaction to that. But what are your thoughts on the mix that's required today to be effective? Well, I mean, the mix is critical now because as I said, if you just focus on mid-bottom funnel, you're just going to be wallowing within that sort of mid... You still have to have the top of the funnel to feed that mid-bottom funnel, right? Mm -hmm. And the bigger that is the better you're going to be at converting at mid-bottom funnel, right? And Mm -hmm. you don't want to just fill it with prospects or eyeballs, if you will, that aren't in your target and aren't interested. So you still need the efficiency of reaching. And this is why the addressable video is really critical and the ability to do that now or understand that better because you want to fill the top of the funnel with the you know as many of your best potential prospects as possible. You don't want to just fill it with everybody. So, I mean, you don't buy a Super Bowl spot. No one buys a Super, you know, not just anyone buys a Super Bowl spot, right? You've got to be somewhat of a democratized brand like McDonald's to be buying a Super Bowl spot because you're basically talking to everybody at a one point in time sort of event. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you still want to be smart about who's watching that content, so that video content mm-hmm. that you're sponsoring, whether it be connected or streaming or otherwise, mm-hmm. and make sure that the makeup of that audience is, you know, as rich in your target as possible, because then you're feeding that middle and bottom funnel and you're making it more efficient because you've got better prospects coming in as opposed to maybe 10% of them coming in that are really viable. If they're 50%, then your chances of converting them are a lot better at mid bottom funnel for sure. Mm-hmm. Can you think of, this is more of a tactical question, but can you think of a particular partnership in the past that was transformative to the business that you worked with? I know Jockey, for example, has got a lot of retail partnerships, but does anything come to mind throughout your business career that that stands out specific with any partnership that the company that you're with had? You know, nothing that I would say is transformative. You know, I think it's more of a collection of the right partners, you know, certainly at Redbox because... You're so limited in getting paid media to be effective, just given the trajectory of the business. It was really like getting the right sort of mix of influencers and, you know, the mix of partners, you know, whether it be popcorn company, you know, or pizza companies, you know, as partners, which are real obvious. Redbox is a relationship with DoorDash. I mean, these are sort of the obvious combinations of my audience and your audience are really very complementary. And what we bring to the table is really complementary one business to the other. I think when you start to It's not just sort of this one thing is what did it. I mean, there are a lot of Instagram brands that were out there because they had one big celebrity endorser use their product on Instagram became viral. There's a lot of those out there. I've not been a part of those. But I think when you put together the right mix of either your marketing, your business partners, like I said, in the case of Redbox, the pizza and the popcorn kinds of companies, Mm -hmm. along with things like the door dashes where you could do a dinner and a movie kind of a thing. Those are really nice. You start to aggregate those. Mm -hmm. They become transformative for sure. Yeah. Yeah, those are the partnerships I love the most personally, where businesses that really belong together are working together creatively and bringing value to the end consumer. And, and I have to believe that that sort of partnership just lifts the brand equity of both brands, right? That that consumer no question. is saying, hey, these guys are thinking about me. They're trying to create more value, better experience for me. And I appreciate that. So I think that goes And they more. create an ongoing relationship, right? You know, acquisition is so expensive. You mm-hmm. don't want to be in constant acquisition mode. You know, you want to make sure that you're building a nice retained base of repeat business mm-hmm. because it's that repeat business where all the margin is. The mm-hmm. acquisition side drives your top line. 
but that mm-hmm. repeat business drives your bottom line. And mm-hmm. so you've really got to have that right next to both too. Mm-hmm. If you deliver a consistent experience, then you're going to have that retention aspect of it. And you've got to, I mean, you've got to have both as well. But that's part of, you know, to the earlier conversation, Dave, about marketing mix, there is the acquisition versus retention side of your marketing mix, which is your acquisition versus retention side of your, of your media mix. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. Excellent. You've had a long, successful career, very accomplished. Maybe just more of a personal and professional question, because a lot of our audience members are growing and evolving their own personal and professional careers. What led you to your role and focus on marketing, strategy, and partnerships, and any background influences that have been important in your life? Well, if you go all the way back to school, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a liberal arts person. And so I just uh, was drawn initially to the world of marketing because there was sort of this creativity, but there was also data as well. Even back in the day, the CPG companies were the initial ones that really were collecting a lot of primary consumer data and they had, they could tie it pretty nicely to their sales. Mm -hmm. So I started out in that world because there was sort of the, if we have a creative message, there's still the sort of functional and the emotional side of it, which is Mm -hmm. fascinating to me about just consumer behavior and human behavior and mm-hmm. storytelling. And if you tell that story, you know, Leo Burnett talked about the inherent product drama back in the day. He also said mm-hmm. the best way to kill a bad product is with good advertising. You know, I think if you look at those things that are sort of still present today, that's what was mm-hmm. really interesting. And then as I advanced in my career and I learned a lot about how to engage consumers, you know, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to go talk to consumers. I mean, to me, at the end of the day, marketing and the best marketing is consumer centric customer centric. Mm-hmm. They've mm-hmm. got to be at the center of the discussion. You've yeah. got to drive that throughout a business. And whenever a business walks away from that or sort of turns their head a little bit away from their consumer or their customer, that's where they start to fall down. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing is if you start to fall away from your sort of competency or your authenticity as a brand or a business, that's the other area where you can really get mm-hmm. into trouble. You know, I've been fortunate in the last 10 years on my you know, corporate brand side. You know, one of the best advocates of that was my old boss at Pulte and McDonald's, Deborah Wall, who's now the global CMO at GM. And there wasn't anyone who was more consumer centric than she was. And it was always about what's, mm-hmm. what is the consumer telling us? What's the mm-hmm. data telling us? Where's the market going? How are we going to go get that? And so that's mm-hmm. just something that sort of was very much sort of reinforced in me and the opportunity to work for her in those two places that were really tremendous in sort of just with the success that, that we had at Pulte, the success that was at McDonald's just reinforced, you know, the fundamentals sort of still apply. Talk to your consumer, understand what they want, not what you want. Mm-hmm. Meet them where they are and make sure that you deliver a product or an experience that is unique, beneficial to them and unique to you because that's where you do get that retention and continue to serve them and continue to watch them and evolve with them and try to move ahead of them to some extent. Because the other thing that I've learned on the corporate side is just you can't just turn the marketing on, right? It takes a while for a business to ramp up their supply chain, make sure they've got the inventory, make sure they've got the product or supply ready. So when that business comes, you can meet it. You don't want to have too much supply. You don't want to have too little supply. So that's the other thing that McDonald's really teaches you is if you think about, let's see if we can raise sales on chicken sandwiches by 2% next quarter. Okay, so I'm going to have to have 2% more chickens, which means you got to go all the way back to the farm to make sure that at some point in time, they've got 2% more chickens hatching <laughs> and going through the supply chain to get to the back of the, of the restaurant. So it's there in time for you to start to advertise that. The sequencing and the orchestration of that and the, co- the company as complex as that is incredible. So it's not just, hey, up the advertising, we'll do this. It's like, well, you better make sure you've got the inventory ready. Not too much and not too little. And so the ability to, this is where marketers, I think, have really got to tie themselves to the business and operational side of companies as well, because you can't promise something to a consumer that they can't make or deliver. And so you better make sure that you can make and deliver it. And you better make sure it's something the consumer wants and values and is going to pay for. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I would only add to that and agree with the KYC, know your customer, talk to your customer. I would just add to that, maybe embrace the fact that other people are talking about you, right? It's not just about yep. you talking with your customer, but just embrace the fact that, you know, you've got a whole new ecosystem of content creators, publishers, and business that businesses that are talking about you or have the potential to talk about you. So how do you engage them, inform them, draw an alliance with them so that they're essentially referring you business? That's the whole opportunity that we advocate for here in the partnership. And make sure now in this world of transparency that 
pretty much anything that you do is going to eventually get out in the open. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I think the other part of yeah, this And I think is, that's a good thing. That's a good I thing. I do it too. Just raises I the bar in quality and the whole customer experience. I absolutely agree. I mean, I think that's the good news is, in my mind, is is what this does is, yes, there's the downside. You know, there's a lot of false information out there. There's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of potential and danger in the sort of digital communications world. But I think there's also a lot of good, and I've always been a glass half full kind of person mm-hmm. that is. That transparency also brings a lot of bad things and can bring a lot of bad things to light, mm-hmm. which then can be used to change for the better. And I do mm-hmm. think it's for the better. And I think any good business needs to understand that they need to be conducting themselves in a way that if this becomes public, you know, mm-hmm. they need to take that into account. Because ultimately, if you're going to put yourself out there as a marketer, you're going to warrant scrutiny back. And you got to be ready for that scrutiny. Is there anything that keeps you up at night, Fred? I think the thing that keeps you up at night as a marketer is just what's being said about you that may be false, that becomes viral. Or even worse, what could be misunderstood about an action or a product that could become viral and you kind of lose control of that conversation. I think that's a really, that's a thing. And it gets around brand safety too. I think that part and parcel is just my brand suddenly shows up somewhere where I didn't intend it to or expected it to, and it's mm-hmm. affiliated or associated with something that I would have nothing to do with. Mm-hmm. So brand safety, I know, because I've been part of the a and in the brand safety and where our brands show up and in, in sort of paid is or adjacency to content is a real problem and mm-hmm. something that we're trying to address. I know as a, as a function, as an industry, and as a marketer, you do worry about things you can't control in terms of where your message or your brand shows up. And that keeps every marketer up at night right now. Yeah, I haven't really thought hard about that. I think that that is a huge concern. It has to be for a lot of companies. And, you know, when you look at this democratized society that we're all operating in, you know, you can't control it so much. And so, it, it, like, I immediately think, how do businesses operate knowing that like i think values become important like transparency yeah. becomes important like preparing yourself to deal with that versus knee-jerk reactions hiding things and having misfires on how you deal with it. there should be anything that you're afraid of hey if you make a mistake admit it and hopefully it passes yeah i think it raises the bar i think for how companies engage yeah i think the key is do business in an ethical manner right mm-hmm. conduct yourself in an ethical manner and that certainly insulates you a lot. But then you've got to prepare for things that do get out of control quickly. And then to your point, you need to address it quickly. You need to address it in a very authentic and transparent manner as well. If there is something that is, if there's a mistake made, own up to it and admit to it and talk about how it's going to get corrected. If a mistake hasn't been made, talk about what happened and why and why it's important to you to get in front of it as a brand because it is not what you stand for. So there's a lot to sort of unpack there. But I think that the first thing is do good and do no harm Mm -hmm. as a business and then be ready to be as authentic and transparent as you can in addressing something that that gets beyond your control that you need to get Mm -hmm. quickly under control. Yeah. Any advice, Fred, that you'd give your younger professional self then? I think it's advice that we probably all heard, but I think I was listening to and follow more closely that change is inevitable. And I think the advice I would say is while you may have known that change was inevitable, the pace of change is going to accelerate in a way that I don't think anybody could have seen 20, 30 years ago. And I think it's going to continue to accelerate. So while we all know we have to live in a changing society, I think we all have to admit that the pace of change is doubling faster. And so it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> I, agree. I agree with that. I agree with that. Well, Fred Ayle, this has been a fascinating conversation. You've been generous with your time. I want to thank you so much for being part of the Partnership Economy podcast. Thank you, Dave. Cheers. Cheers.